Hi everybody. I hope this finds you doing well and welcome to Monday Night Meditation. I can't wait to see you guys in two weeks. I'll be there in person and look forward to hugging your necks and just catching up with you. But I'm going to get right into our scripture tonight. It comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. I'm in chapter 3 and going to be reading verses 1 through 5. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. Wow, wow. All right, so this isn't that unusual in the sense that here we are in the New Testament and we find Jesus in the synagogue, the temple. Um, there are several stories in the gospels that tell us this. It's also not unusual that trailing right behind him are the Pharisees just waiting to catch him in the moment um, that he's actually doing good, that he's healing somebody or giving them fresh life or fresh sight. Um, and it's not unusual that Jesus is with someone who has a physical ailment, um, a withered hand, a leprosy, um, a bleeding disorder. Those are all mentioned in the New Testament. So none of that is super unusual. What's interesting though about this particular story is that biblical historians believe that the man with the withered hand in this particular instance was not born with it. In other words, um, they think that he may have even been an expert to Mason. So perhaps he helped hewn the columns outside of the synagogue. So something happened, maybe he was injured on the job, maybe he was injured elsewhere, something happened where his hand became withered. So here he is in the synagogue and it said this man came again. He, he had been there before. This was not his, his first time at the synagogue. And I want you to think about this. Um, in the first century, the, the Jewish culture um, was that if you sinned, or excuse me, if you had an ailment, that meant that you sinned or your parents sinned, sometimes perhaps even both. So what's interesting is this man would have known people in the synagogue. He would have grown up here and he probably had friends, right? And he probably had his favorite pew, if they had pews, I doubt they did. But he probably had his favorite spot that he went to with his family, with his friends in the synagogue. But now he was relegated to the back. Now he was with the untouchables and with the unclean. But what's interesting is he still came. I, I believe that sometimes we feel like we have to get ourselves together to kind of get presentable, you know, our Sunday best, if it were, both externally and internally, before we come to God's house to worship. And let us note that that's not what took place here. He came withered hand and all. And as he was relegated to the back and his friends and um, other acquaintances began to filter into the synagogue, can't you just hear the crowd coming in? And can't you just see them kind of glancing over? Gosh, did he come again? Is he, is he here? And the snickers and the sneers as they basically ignored this person that they had known their whole life. Um, and gone forward and, and sat in their, in their favorite spot while he was relegated to the back. So that's one aspect that I wanted to bring forward tonight is, is that oftentimes we are alone in our pain and yet it's a public display, right? Here he is at the synagogue and I'm sure he was trying to hide his withered hand. He probably pulled his cloak over it more than once, but everyone knew, everyone knew. But look at what happens next. Jesus comes in and he finds this gentleman. He probably knew right where he was going because the gentleman, as we said, had been here before. So Jesus comes to him and he has two phrases for him. The first is, come here. You know, Jesus calls all of us and he calls all of us to, be, to come to him. And we have a choice. This man had a choice. He was at the back of the synagogue. He could have turned around and walked away, run away, and no one would have 
thought that he would do anything different, to be honest with you. He was meant to be shamed and humiliated because of his condition. But he steps forward anyway. So he's coming to the house of God with a withered hand. He didn't wait until he had it all together or was presentable by his cultural standards. He came anyway. And then when Jesus looks him in the eye, and I'm sure he was embarrassed. I'm sure it was the last thing he wanted was for attention to be drawn to him. I'm sure he had heard of Jesus, maybe had not had a personal encounter with him, but he probably knew about him. And yet when Jesus spoke those words, I bet he really knew him and he walked forward. The second thing that Jesus says to him is, stretch out your hand. Okay, now we've just entered a whole different league here. It's one thing to call me out, Jesus, in front of my former friends and acquaintances and my community, really making note of this withered hand of mine. It's a whole nother thing for you to actually verbally call it out and tell me to do the very thing with it that you know I can't do. By definition, a withered hand has atrophied. So this man can be firing this, the, the neurons to his hand and say, stretch yourself out, and the hand is just not gonna respond. It's not working. Wow. So Jesus calls him out, not private, privately, but publicly, and then he asks him to do the very thing that he knows he cannot do on his own. So let that be the foundation for us to enter our meditation this evening. So. Come into the edge of your seat, wherever your seat is, be it a chair, be it a, um, a sofa, be it a cushion, be it the floor. So come perched on the edge of it and let us take a moment to kind of settle in to this physical space. Let's bring one hand to the center of our chest and the other hand to our lower abdomen. Ah, let's just breathe God in, his goodness and his glory and the grace that he bestows upon us. And as we exhale, let's just release any stress, any tension, any anxiety that we knowing or unknowingly brought into this space. Let's take another inhalation through the nose, draw it in all the way through, let the lungs fill with air, and as they do, they're gonna rise and press against the palm of your hand there. And we're gonna to continue to inhale, pushing through the gateway of the diaphragm so the breath enters the belly. It warms the belly, it rises and presses against the palm of the hand there. And then on an exhalation, we'll do the opposite. We're gonna visualize the navel center, your belly button, and you're gonna draw that back towards your spine. And in so doing, you're going to totally draw the belly in, the breath is pushed up and out of it, through the gateway of the diaphragm, into the lungs, up and out of the throat, out of the nose from which it came. And that is our fluid diaphragmatic breathing that we want to continue throughout this meditation. So as always, at any point in time that you get distracted, it's fine. Don't berate yourself or belittle yourself. Just acknowledge it, that it's taken place, that it's happened, and then bring yourself back time and again to the breath. It will always be here waiting for you, and it will always unite you to the present moment. So here we are transitioning and as you are comfortable, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. Remembering that as we close our eyes, we let go of a lot of the external stimulation and so that we can focus on what's taking place inside. And so in your mind's eye, I want you to visualize the scene that we read from Mark chapter four. I want you to visualize in antiquity what you envision a synagogue would look like. Tall pillars made of stone. Fill in the details, but I want you to set the stage in your mind's eye. Before we go any farther with your eyes closed, I do want you to take a moment and with the loving kindness of the Holy Spirit, I want you to identify what your withered hand is. So, for example, it very much could be something physical. I, for example, am blind in my left eye, legally at least, and I have been since I was born. So I could say authentically that that is my withered hand. But to be honest with you, that really doesn't impede 
my day-to-day -day activity. I may run into a door on the left side, someone speaks to me or waves to me on that side, it may take me a moment to catch on. But generally speaking, that doesn't really separate me from a lot of life. If I'm being fully transparent with you, my withered hand today might be something like this. I really like acknowledgement, especially when I've done well. And I really like doing well in school. And that can be my withered hand today. Because even though that sounds like a really good thing, I can put it above other things so that I can neglect other things and people that I love and I can make that performance an idol. So that could be my withered hand today. So take a moment and be honest with yourself. Again, the Holy Spirit will guide you there and identify in your mind's eye with a word or a few words what your withered hand is. So take a breath cycle to do that. Now that you've set the scene, set the stage, and now that you've identified your withered hand, I want you to place yourself in the back of the synagogue. You are now the man with the withered hand. And I want you to visualize in your mind's eye the crowd coming in for worship. The chatter, the talking that's taking place, the laughing, all of this you are standing outside of. And I want you just to settle in for a moment that loneliness, that separateness that you feel, that you are alone, even in the midst of a crowd. And I want you to somehow notice your withered hand. If it's a part of your body, perhaps you can touch it. If it's internal, you recall the word or the words that you used to identify it. Next, what happens you could never even believe, Jesus walks in, kind of with the crowd and yet kind of behind it. There's a group behind him, Pharisees. And as Jesus walks in, he seems to be looking through the crowd for somebody. He's scanning, his eyes go from the right to the left and back again. And all of a sudden, he turns around and he looks at you. And Jesus looks through you. And he says these words, come here. And you don't know what overcame you because if you had thought for two seconds about it, you would have turned around and run off. But something in his eyes is so compelling. No one's ever looked at you like that before. And so it's almost like you have no choice. You, you step forward and then you realize that you're drawing attention to yourself, that Jesus is bringing attention to this situation. He didn't mean to, it's just attention follows Jesus. And now not only are the Pharisees watching, but everybody who had gone into the temple earlier has turned around and they're watching this whole situation, but you don't really care. And then Jesus says something that is staggering to you. He says, stretch out your hand. And I don't want you to fill in the blank. Stretch out your blank, whatever word or words you use to identify what your withered hand is today. He's asking you to reveal the very thing that you have been attempting for so long to hide. And once again, you don't even have to think about it. You're saying to yourself, well, I can't do that, but something makes you hold it up just the same. And as you do, and as you send that message to the hand that you've sent it so many times to stretch itself out, it begins to move. And so whatever your withered hand is, I want you to visualize it healing itself. Spontaneous healing, literally right before your eyes and the eyes of everyone else. That need to perform is healed. You understand now that you're worthy just from being a child of the Most High God. He is your reward. 
whatever it is that you filled in the blank of your withered hand, Jesus calls it out. He reveals it, not just privately, but publicly so that he can give you the respect and the honor of your community that has been taken from you. The very thing that society will tell you to hide in shame from and that you should be humiliated by is the very thing that Christ wants to heal you from because he knows that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no humiliation for any affliction that you have. He is here to heal it and heal it publicly for all to see. And it is the most beautiful thing ever because now you know what's going to happen you're going to be able to help someone walk down that path of healing because you've walked down it with Jesus. Genesis 12, the story of Abraham and the nation of Israel. And God is promising, it's the covenant, it's the Abrahamic covenant. And he's telling him, I'm going to bless you and your family, Abraham, but not just for your sake. I'm going to bless you so that all the nations will be blessed. So guys, when we're blessed with the revelation of the truth of the Most High God, when we're blessed with the healing, however magnificent and miraculous it can be, or perhaps it's just a small mindset that God changed in us. Whatever it is, when we experience that healing, it's not just for our sake. It's to turn around and bless others. Wow. Maybe your eyes have been opened at this point. Maybe they're closed. Maybe it's been a little bit of each but I'm gonna ask you to close them again if they were open as we close ourselves out in prayer. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to read your word, just five short lines in a chapter, Father. How much information is there? It's unbelievable. Father, create a passion in us to be in your word on a daily basis so that we can experience this transformation. Thank you for your word tonight, Father, that whatever has been dehumanized in our life experience from an accident, from words that were spoken, harmful words over us or harmful words or deeds that we did to ourselves, Father, remind us that you have the final word and that you can heal all. Father, give us the courage that when you ask us to come to you, we will instead of turning and running. And Father, when you ask us to stretch out our woundedness to you, our brokenness, Father, let us be humble enough and transparent enough to be naked in front of you, knowing that you see all and that you are there to heal, to patch up that which has been broken. We ask us in the holy and the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the redeemer of the human race, whose very name means God saves. Amen and amen. Ah, good night, ladies. I hope you enjoyed it. Blessings to you, and I'll see you in a couple weeks. I'll see you next week here uh, for the videos and then in two weeks in person. Bye, guys.